Beyond, and hello everyone. My name is Jonathan Dornbush, and this is Podcast Beyond, episode 661, an episode I am starting as I prepare a treat thing for my dog because he's angry that I'm recording this show. <laughs> uh, I'm joined this week by Brian Altano. Sure, he can he can he can bark for me. <laughs> yeah, he can bark for you. And we're also joined by Max yeah. Scoville. You should get him like an Xbox controller shaped squeaky toy so that he can go mm. and be a PlayStation show disrupting comet or in dog form. <laughs> That's a good idea. Uh, what do you think of this controller? And then he just bites it up. Obviously, he's mad that I haven't given him that treat yet, so I'm going to send it his way. Uh, of course, we are going to be talking all about the state of play, which just wrapped up as we're recording the show. Unfortunately, Lucy O'Brien can't be with us because her internet has decided why why work today. That's unnecessary. Uh, so she's figuring that all out. But uh, of course, if you're wondering where our regularly scheduled episode is, it already happened, so you can go back and listen to that either on YouTube, IGN, or your favorite podcast services. It's all up there. Uh, but so yeah, we wanted to do a second episode to break down this state of play, and uh, we have a full wrap-up, all of the video screenshots, all that stuff on IGN. You can check out a full breakdown of it. I don't think we'll be going game by game during this, but uh, this state of play, of course, did come with the expectations that there would not be any major first-party announcements. There would not be any major hardware or business-related uh announcements so assumedly we wouldn't hear about any first party acquisitions or anything like that uh it was basically going to be focused on ps4 psvr and some third party indie updates when it comes to ps5 um so with that all in mind as the expectations were set just sort of a general top-down feel brian i'll start with you how did you feel about the show overall uh <laughs> it it, I guess uh, like a, a C, I would say, yeah. like a six out of 10, or I guess that would be a, a not not a C, a C is like a seven, right? So yeah, I would give it a six yeah. out of 10. I guess okay. that's a D. That's yeah, why that, we don't uh, do letters. Yeah, Max. Let's do, let's do, I got a better idea. Let's do states. If that's if that Ooh. state of play was a state, it would be a solid New Hampshire, which I don't really have any strong feelings about. I don't particularly dislike it, but it doesn't really get me excited. Nobody's like, I want to go to New Hampshire. And I go, hell yeah, let's go to New Hampshire. Right. It's just, it was, it was fine. Like, I feel like they were good in terms of getting the expectations on the right level. But at the same time, like, you know, they were like, it's going to be 40 plus minutes. And I was like, well, yeah, it, it sure was. But, mm -hmm. you know, what, what, it was fine. It, it's all right. What else are we going to do in 2020? Watch the news. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think what other states it would be similar to in that, like, most of it I'm not really interested in visiting, but it had some <laughs> towns that could, be, that could be cool. <laughs> yeah, um, it's, yeah, I, I guess, I, I guess that's a good way of putting it. It is, uh, I will never, never turn one of these things down, but it is, it does feel a little weird that it was, it was just sort of like a kind of a few small things, some slightly bigger things all glued together, but nothing really like, Holy crap, that's that was huge. But I think I they think, set those I think expectations, like the, right? The key thing is like these have been so sort of inconsistent. Um yeah. if like if they if when these were first announced, was it like last year around E3? Uh if somebody had like done these on a on a regular enough cycle, like kind of like Nintendo Directs are, I feel like we'd be more accustomed to like what to expect. But the fact that this is this is coming along, especially when we're so hungry for PS5 news, it's just a little bit like it's even even when they're completely preparing us, it's still a little hard not to be like a little bit underwhelmed and just like, well, but I wanted more. You know? Even Nintendo Directs have sort of pivoted recently with the their announcement of those like new mini directs they're doing. And so, like, I think even even the cadence of what these things used to be is now going away. And so mm -hmm. that's I don't I don't know how I feel about all that. Like, it's cool to get like kind of information drops like this. But on the flip side, like, I'd rather. I'd rather they sort of like charge up the laser beam and blast it when it's when it's big and strong. Right. Yeah, it's it's a weird thing because, uh, you know, uh, I think it was maybe a month or two ago. They did almost like a state of play on the PlayStation blog of 10 big upcoming indie games for PS4 and PS5. And I wonder, like, why wasn't that a state of play presentation? Uh, Max, to your point, like the identity of what this is. This year, State of Play has been The Last of Us and Ghost of Tsushima showcases. And last year was the first one where they focused so much on PSVR that people got very upset that it wasn't focused enough on PS4. So they pivoted and the second one had, you know, FF7 Remake finally coming back and a big Monster Hunter uh, Iceborne uh, DLC showcase and like big games that people wanted to see. And it has been this uneven, inconsistent thing that I don't really know what the identity of it is. Um, 
And so going into this presentation, the expectations were set. But I also I, I, I was hoping for, I guess, more big surprises. Um, yeah, I think even the, the pacing of it was weird, like the um, the cold open of just kind of like rolling right into the Crash 4 stuff, which is going to be a huge game. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, um, I, it felt like a like it, it just went from sort of a blank screen to to that. And I know they've experimented with that before, but I would have liked a little bit of like. Hey, welcome to blah, blah, blah. Like they got to that after the fact. And so like right off the bat, I feel like they like stumbled immediately and then never really caught up. Yeah, there was a strange like and don't get me wrong. I loved it. And we'll talk about the stuff that we did like in a second. The uh, the Crash 4 look did look great and it had a lot of content in there and a lot of details. But it was the strange thing of going from that to here's a 30 second teaser kind of telling you the last three Hitman games, including the new one, are going to be in VR. Anyway, see you later. And it was just like, oh, that seems like a really big announcement to just gloss over like that. Um, there, it, it, it was a very strange flow to it that, yeah, I totally agree with you. Felt like. I, I don't know if there had maybe been this had almost been split up or this felt like the the stuff in between where there should have been a like first party announcement um, like there, there could have been a good balance to it. Not to say that there wasn't great stuff during that presentation. There were a lot of fun games I'm looking forward to. But yeah, it was a strange 45 minute presentation to have right now. Yeah, I actually didn't think I realized how long it was because they've done ones in the past that were much shorter and much better. and so. Um, that said, like, I, I do appreciate state of play as a vehicle to shine a light on a bunch of games that I think people maybe, maybe wouldn't have paid attention to otherwise. Um, and so that's cool. I hope that continues. Something just felt a little bit sort of like limp about this one. Like it was, I saw some, I saw some conversation on Twitter about how people were speculating that something got, uh, left off at the end, like that there was going to be some big one more thing that just didn't happen. Um, Mm -hmm. I know like Jeff Grubb, who's been sort of pretty good about predicting stuff or having like insider info, seems really convinced that it was some EA thing. Uh, and I don't, I don't know how much of that is like wishful thinking or just sort of like, you know, armchair quarterback or, you know, guessing or whatever. But like, um, yeah, I don't know. It was it was odd to see like a kind of a, a sprinkling of, you know, when we think third party, I feel like we think uh, usually like AAA third party. And this was definitely third party. It was a bunch of like a lot of indie stuff. And then you had, you know, Hitman and then you had. Um, uh godfall and uh you know it feels like there could have been maybe like one, another big sort of you know really recognized ip in there but yeah i don't know yeah like i was surprised that you know on the a front this would have probably been a good place to show squadrons for five minutes to show off like a story mission or you know teases for uh, a multiplayer match um it could have been that or even something on the star wars front lego star wars is supposed to come out this year uh, and other than October, the, yeah, Octo uh, yeah uh, well, that release date was leaked in an episode of the Star Wars show, then removed from that episode. And other than that, we got key art for the game. And that's been it this year. So that's like, a, also that game, like I know that we're sort of like, oh, another Lego game. That's fine. That game performs weirdly well. That was our like the yeah. trailer for that was our biggest thing out of E3 last year. I've been on like random episodes of like news, news shows, you know, live streams and stuff. And people in the chat are just like. When is Lego Star Wars coming? When do we get it? And it's like, I get that you're eight and you're on the computer for the first time, but chill, like, calm down. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this one too, like on that note of what wasn't there, that one's supposed to kind of, it's changing the perspective. It's open world in a new way. Like it's doing all this cool stuff uh, that I'm personally really excited for is like someone who jumps into those Lego games once a year, has like a fun 25 hours and then bounces. But yeah, it just felt like, knowing what's coming this fall this wasn't necessarily like a here's what you're going to get in the next four months of ps4 right. it wasn't a here's what you're going to get on the ps5 early next year it was like a mish a mishmash of everything and so nothing felt like it was truly a standout for me at least personally let's see um on the official playstation channel uh this state of play currently as of you know it's been live for 102 minutes 343,000 views, 33,000 likes, 15,000 dislikes. Not saying that that's indicative of anything because YouTube is, you know, a very negative place. Um, IGN, 92,000 views, 7.4 thousand likes and 4,000 dislikes. So it's like, I, I, I think, I mean, I think people do go into these things with expectations, even yeah. when, like we talked about just on at the other episode this week, even when they outline lower expectations as much as possible i think people still want a, a surprise and i think that like you kind of have to have a one more thing surprise at the end of these things now and if you don't yeah. something feels off like they 
the pacing of, of like having you know finishing with the godfall gameplay and then just like kind of wrapping it up i and uh, it'd be one of those things where if we were all if we were all went to a place to see this we all would just be quietly like shuffling out of the room kind of yeah. like kicking rocks being like oh, that was- well it, it reminded me of the e3 conference where they had both death stranding or not death stranding forgive me uh days gone at the beginning and end of the showcase and like regardless of reception to that game when it came out like it's weird to have a conference that opens and closes with the same game in different capacities like that definitely felt like something was missing there and yeah in the same way that like here's a long godfall presentation and then it's over felt like a strange end and similarly the um the rumors around that one was that they had something else there and it fell out yeah um which i will never really know until you know somebody leaves sony and writes some expose or something but uh exactly i i do want to get to the content of it but yeah i I will say games (laughs) i yeah i will say it is the you know even though they set expectations it is the strange thing that we still want these big questions and these big reasons to buy the big fall PS5 games. And so with that hanging over this, it's strange to go into this. That said, I think the thing they did really right with this one, and it felt like a very knowing um, response to all of the criticisms of Xbox was this primarily was gameplay. Like for every game that was shown, I, I would say like it was a, you know, one to three ratio, one was cinematic, three were gameplay focused. Like they really, really did uh, double and triple down on showing gameplay for almost everything across the board, which I thought was really smart and really good for a a lot of, especially games that are maybe not the ones you're thinking of when we go into the fall. Mm -hmm. Um, And obviously that kicked off with the the big Crash 4 gameplay and then ended with the long Godfall gameplay. Uh, For me personally, I do want to highlight like, the Crash 4 look was awesome uh, as, as someone who's really excited for that game, but also trepidatious at the idea of, hey, it's a sequel to that original trilogy you love, because that obviously is like a, we want you to hopefully like this game after a number of not great Crash games. Um, right. I thought it looked really cool. I thought the idea of the uh, inverted mirror mode having every level be unique is really cool. Um, so it's not just like, here's a reflection of the level and you have to go left instead of right this time. It's like, no, this one will have a wacky look to it. This one will have a surrealist art style. This one will be black and white. This one will have new enemies here. This will have a different perspective. I thought like as someone who does come to crash for a lot of challenge and trying to hundred percent everything, that is a really, really great packed uh, incentive to keep going into this game for a long time. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm I'm totally lukewarm on this game just because like, I've been sort of half jokingly been like, give us crash bandicoot or whatever, (laughs) but like, I, I was kind of hoping for more of something like a Mario Odyssey where they like a full reinvention of what Crash Bandicoot should be in, in 2020. For um, sure. I was just gonna not, you know, that. Yeah. And it's like it's it looks cool. And I think people who enjoy the older games are definitely going to you know get a kick out of this. And like these guys do clearly put like a ton of love and care into what they're doing. It looks stunning. But in terms of the core basic uh, gameplay experience. That was I feel like that was never the thing that really that really hooked me about Crash or never made, got me excited. It was always more like, hey, it's a playable cartoon. And now it's like, you know, I don't know. I'll get I'll play Ratchet Clank, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely not um, sort of what, you know, the God of War from two years ago did to that franchise <laughs> or what Mario Odyssey or, or Breath of the Wild did to, you know, Mario and Zelda, respectively. Um, that said, I don't feel like this is this franchise is totally oversaturated to the point that it fully needed a reboot but i totally would have appreciated one more mm-hmm. um it's it's a tough call to make because like you want to uh satiate the people who grew up with this franchise but at the same time you know it's it's always awesome to me when a developer goes like this is our new vision for this sort of timeless classic character um it it looks you know, if if you had not explained it to me or they had not explained it to me, I would have just guessed this was like an HD remake of one of the older games um, at, at sort of like if you're passing through a GameStop and it's playing on a monitor back when we went to those things. Um, <laughs> I, I would just guess it's a it was a trailer for the for the remake. But I think that there is enough interesting new stuff here, new playable characters. Uh, I, I liked what they were talking about, about like going back to the roots of the cartoons and animation that influenced uh, the Crash Bandicoot series. I want to see how far that goes. Um, yeah, they mentioned that, and I didn't really see anything that popped out. But then again, I don't really know enough about the original animation that influenced Crash to begin with. But the mode you were talking about is um, it's kind of interesting. Uh, it just it felt sort of like they put like some 
Photoshop filters over filters. some levels? <laughs> yeah, for yeah. a couple of the levels, for sure. It, I mean, every level is going to have it, and the rumor right now is there are 100 levels, so I, I am sure there are going to be a couple levels there that are... It's more of just like a, a visual, you know, palette swap. But no, it's I, like, that's a really a cool feature to have in there. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Like, to if you're going to be do, replaying stuff, I think adding like a little extra, you know, a little wrinkle to it to make it, you know, special is is fun. Yeah, the the only thing I'll say about like that balance between the you know wanting this like true revolutionary like open world change to it versus obviously where they've chosen to go, uh, hewing back to more of the original stuff. I think the reason they chose this path rather than trying something a little too ambitiously new is because most of the crashes that came after the trilogy kept trying to reinvent the wheel, right. and they were always pretty middling. And so I think we could still get that in the future. I don't think this precludes that from ever happening, but this definitely feels like a hey before crash becomes something new we need to remind you that we know what crash was to you. yeah no that's uh, totally so, that's so and like you're you're yeah. like a, a hardcore crash fan and you're actually really you're stoked in this so clearly they're doing something right whereas yeah i'm, I'm more of a casual fan I guess you could say. <laughs> um, and i will say with like dingo dial being a new playable character playing as cortex in the preview build that we got a few weeks ago to play he felt totally different from crash and so suddenly and it didn't feel like a a quick character palette swap or like a really not thought through new set of skills like it felt like an entirely new character that if you told me this was a spin-off game that he was built for i'd believe it so i'm i'm hopeful that we're going to see that kind of thought and care throughout the whole game Totally. I and I'm. I mean, I'm not the biggest Crash fan. I don't have anything against the franchise. For this sure. is, this yeah. reminded totally reminded me of the Blob, by the way. Like, oh yeah, yeah. Or um, uh, what's it called? Unfinished Swan. Just like one of those oh, games yeah. where you're running through and adding color splashes to a black and white area. But I am a huge fan of platformers, both 2D and 3D. And there was a lot of really cool stuff, really inventive stuff happening in this trailer. Uh, the 2D stuff, especially like some of the more sort of like weird cerebral you know uh, underground upside down nonsense with like th- that reminded me very much of stuff that we saw like at the sort of peak of the mario galaxy games and so yeah i'm totally into that um this looks fun it looks like a like a, a fun challenge um yeah i'm I, i'll definitely i'll definitely play this one uh but yeah, yeah it, part of me does want to see like what these guys do after this because i think yeah. there's you know, there's definitely a future for this character. I think for what we see from like Toys for Bob, both from the like spiral artwork and from the artwork here is like they are really into bringing out like that cartoony style um, and really playing to that. So I think the longer we get into them having time with Crash, the more we're going to see them really uh, dive into that stuff. Uh, I, I do want to move on from Crash, though, because, of course, there were a ton of other games. Brian, I want to ask anything in particular that stood out to you uh, from the showcase that really caught your eye. Um, Let's see. I... And I've got a list I can go through if anyone needs to. Yeah, I'm, it, we just watched this like five seconds ago, so I'm I'm kind of blanking. But the um yeah. the sort of like weird puzzly 2D platformer that lets you interact with environments. Oh, the pedestrian. The pedestrian. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah, yeah. That had some cool stuff going for it. Um, yeah, I think I think that and Crash were the ones where I'm just like, okay, that's that's the closest for me. Um, yeah. And then there are a bunch of other games where I'm like, that looks interesting, and I know it's going to sell well, and I know people will like it, but it's not necessarily my my steez. So one that really um, surprised me during it, because I thought it was going to be something else than what it ended up being, was uh, Hood Outlaws and Legends, which came uh, second to last about in the showcase, third to last maybe. And it looked like, oh, here's a third person action game that's going to, you know, kind of follow in the vein of Sony first party exclusives and be this uh, Robin Hood-esque take on that sort of thing. And it turns out it's a 4v4 multiplayer game. Uh, yeah, which I'm good. That's fine. I, I did not expect. Yeah, I, I, like there's definitely going to be a market for this. And I think like Arthurian legend gets used a lot in pop culture, but maybe not in games as much. Uh, so I, I could see this definitely having a life in the way that something like For Honor has a life. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, we don't play it, but like there's a really big fan base for that and Siege. But um, I mean, I, if they make like a, if they make like Rainbow Six Siege with like medieval weaponry, that kind of sounds awesome. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it depends on if they make it that or a For Honor thing um yeah i mean it was was this was this even was this gameplay or was it cg it was i mean it was, it was a that, flash of gameplay at the end of this trailer which um, yeah yeah you, it's one of those ones where like you know that the actual gameplay is going to be a lot a lot more yeah probably mechanical like there's gonna be much there's gonna be hud and stuff and you're gonna have if, especially if it's multiplayer but yeah i don't know yeah. that's, that's gameplay curious. was cool um i i thought like it's an interesting idea um 4v4 multiplayer obviously it's not really something that i gravitate towards but it's also like 
I don't know, I'm I'm coming off of a year where you know we're getting Watchdog, Cyberpunk, Assassin's Creed, and I I played Ghost of Tsushima and uh, The Last of Us Two and loved them both. And so you know I, I'm completely okay with people getting four v four multiplayer games, even if they're not for me. For sure. Um, big one is Spelunky Two. Yeah, um, that's so say. like I don't I don't play Spelunky. My wife, it's like her favorite game in the world to the point that like it <laughs> borders on addiction where I'd have to be like, okay, give me the Vita, get, go to bed, get off the, get off. And she'd be like, one more run. I have to go to hell and throw the frog at Satan or whatever you do in that game. And like she platinumed it, which is like, that's, that's a hard, oh, wow. that's a hard friggin' game. Um, and so like, that's, that's cool. But there is that weird, uh, like presumably that's going to come to other platforms at some point. Um, I feel like this is sort of, you know, I know this is a PlayStation show, so I'll say this. This was an, a phenomenal Vita game. It would probably also make a phenomenal Nintendo Switch game. I think it's probably coming to Switch at some point, but sort of because this was on a PlayStation stream, it was like coming to PS4 September 15th, which is cool. It's very soon. It's also coming to PC that day. Um, yeah. Kind of no word about where that's going cross platform wise, but like this is awesome. I love that, like, I don't know, I love the sort of the, the level of like Derek, you came on and was just like, hey, here's the game I've been working on. I, I know people are really looking forward to it. And, I feel like like Derek, you wrote he literally wrote he made the game and then he wrote the book on it. Like he put out the boss fights book on Spelunky. And there's this level of kind of like earnest transparency that I think kind of comes with it. And I say I don't I don't like Spelunky. I don't like to play it, but I respect the hell out of it as a as like a phenomenally interesting game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm actually surprised I never got more into this game. Uh I should give it another chance, but um I'm I, I find the like the the kind of fervor around it to be incredibly like endearing and really, really special um andrew goldfarb you know f former uh host uh, co-host the show former friend of the show since the, the huge break <laughs> former friend yeah. became our enemy betrayed yeah. us um he mo-capped all the foxes in ghost of tsushima so go cut him <laughs> um that's not true uh, Aww. He, he was he was like hopelessly addicted to this game too collected all the figurines and he always ran over to me like a little excited little kid to be like look what the community found today like look at these treasures and secrets that are hidden all over this and uh they implied that in in the trailer too to sort of like there's a bunch of stuff in here that developers don't even really know about like uh, maybe they're hiding things from each other and stuff like that and so that's you know I i'm not sure how that works but i think that's <laughs> really cool um i think it was like their sort of randomized levels always, always sort of put me off um that that's never really a thing I'm super into in platformers, but um, this one looks cool. Uh, I'm I'm with you, Max. I'd, I would I would prefer to play this in handheld form. Um, mm -hmm. I was like cleaning out some drawers the other day, and I I found my white Vita, and I was just like, God damn, that was a beautiful system. What a perfect little butte that thing is. Yeah. <laughs> just put, put some more. Put just put a bunch of 2D platformers on there. I know that doesn't happen anymore. Mm -hmm. It's not worth the cost, but God, I wish they could do that. I mean, you could remote else? play. I'm trying to think what else got me like actually really excited during this the hitman thing is is huge like that's a series yeah. that i know i should like because it's got you know so much you know similar dna to metal gear and it's definitely like one of those weird wide open games where you can like put on a chicken costume and like drug somebody with by pouring poison in the soup or whatever but like <laughs> it just it's always it, it never like it's never grabbed me fully and i i don't know why but i'm like i i love that they're just like hey we dropped the whole thing in vr that's so cool yeah, this whole the Hitman three is supposed to come out uh, January twenty twenty one, and alongside that, it'll be the the whole trilogy that IO Interactive has been doing in VR. And yeah, that's right. I'm right there with you. Like, I always love the idea of them, and then I'll play for a level, and I'm like, oh, I messed up. I'm gonna stop for now. Uh, but the, the idea of trying to sneak around these environments in VR and how that's going to change uh, the way you play them, I'm, I'm excited to see how that works out. Uh, speaking on the PSVR front, we also um in terms of soon releases sort of like splunky 2 is coming september 15th vader immortal is being ported to psvr on august 25th uh i've never played that one have you uh, have you guys checked it out on other vr platforms oh yeah yeah no i've 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 played that entirely on oculus uh i really dig it it's a little wonky um and i like the Meyer Rudolph VO for the droid side kick is like borderline <laughs> catatonic. It's super weird, but it does a lot of really interesting stuff. Um, and it's like, I, I think it's, you know, one of the only Star Wars VR experiences I've ever had. Um, the lightsaber fights uh, aren't really like the star of this for me. Like they're pretty cool. And like, once you start like sort of, you know, twisting the controller around, like it, it feels awesome. Uh, but for me, it's, it's sort of just like poking around these massive environments. There's a Rancor fight in the second chapter, which was a blast because 
like rancors have been weirdly omitted from Star Wars video games for a long time now for some inexplicably stupid reason because the people who make those games hate rancors and are dumb. Um, <laughs> and then there's like a bunch of like sort of generic droid fighting stuff, but uh, there's like climb like sneaking around like ladders inside Vader's castle and going on elevators and you know doing all the stuff that's super boring in regular video games in in VR is a blast and so it's cool that this mm-hmm. is going to drop I, I believe all in one package right yeah it's just going to be all three episodes at once which is nice yeah yeah I love uh, that they're I, also that they're putting this on PSVR because like I when they announced that it was basically just an Oculus and it was they were always like it's an interactive experience it's like they used it in like Oculus Quest uh, marketing. And I think there was definitely like a moment where it's like, is that going to be a really cool exclusive for a thing that not that many people jump on? And the fact that it's like after some time has passed, they're like dumping on PSVRs. That's Mm -hmm. good, you know? Yeah. And that same team is working on um, the kind of like Galaxy's Edge. uh, Yeah. First person VR experience game thing. That's the one I want to play. Yeah. And that one looks like it's getting into the weird sort of corners of Star Wars that I really love. And so fingers crossed that comes to PSVR, PSVR 2. because I, I think that's going to be a blast. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited for that one, too, especially uh, at a time where you can't go to Galaxy's Edge. So right, it'll, be, right. it, it'll, it'll be nice if that hits anytime soon. Uh, yeah, another big one, at least for me, that stood out was uh, The Pathless, which is a game we've known about for a while now. Uh, it's from the team that made Abzu, uh, the sort of like journey inspired underwater game. Uh, this one you're playing essentially as an archer with a friendly falcon to help you out in all of your archery. Uh, I liked that we finally saw a a gameplay showcase for this, mostly because we've known about this game for a while, and they've been saying, like, 2020 for some time, and then it was confirmed for PS5, and I'm I'm really excited for it. I think it's a really nice... um, I don't know how to describe the art style exactly, but like it's minimalist. Um, like the the colors are very stark, and you see like the structures and the construction of the world very clearly by the way it mm-hmm. uses color. But I I love it, and I, I like I like the idea of a fun archery game that doesn't see it, they they've made it very clear like they don't want to penalize you for like not being a great archer in a game. Like having pixel perfect aim isn't a requirement when you're trying to feel like the flow and the motion of this game. And so I, I like that the gameplay showed that off a bit for this. I guess I didn't put it together that um, the Abzu team made this. That was actually one of my favorite games that year. I really liked Abzu. Weirdly, the parts I liked the least in Abzu were when you got out of the water and walked around. And so hopefully this is not a whole game of that. But it, <laughs> this definitely, Max and I were texting about it. Like this this definitely feels Breath of the Wildy. Um, yes. Yeah. I'm not crazy about them being like there's no map. I feel like every single time, there's just like one of those things that is just like every single time a developer tries to experiment with that um it like very very rarely works i, I think from soft can pull it off obviously um I, I just recently ranted about carrion which didn't have one and it was kind of frustrating uh we'll see how much of an impact that makes here yeah um yeah, yeah i think um, if it's if it's very like exploration based that could be kind of to its you know to its benefit mm-hmm. uh, i'm totally with you like i was very like sort of at a glance was kind of whatever about it i really I'm not wild about those big button prompts that were showing up because it's like, I feel like if I got transported to a magical realm and there were just like, <laughs> it'd be like large, you know, large information graphics on top of things. I'd be like, okay, this is less magical, but um, maybe you can turn them off. But yeah, the whole, the whole no map thing is, is very cool. Uh, and like, I don't know, like it, it, I, I really love the way like this, this kind of approach to doing a state of state of play demo, I think is really, really smart to be like, Hey, here is, like here's a demo of the game here. This is not like a shotgun blast of uh, just random B roll with all the HUD turned off. And this is not, uh, this is not just like a, a, you know, cinematic trailer that makes you excited for the game, but tells you nothing. Like, this is a really very smart to the point way of kind of uh, showing it off. Yeah. yeah these, it, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say real quick, when we got the big PS five reveal, you know, it was loaded with, you know, big triple a big guns from you know big first party developers and stuff like that the reality is that we won't be playing a lot of those games for a long time and so when when that reality sinks in it is important to realize that in the first year of the ps5 these are the kind of games that you're going to be playing like you're going to be playing sort of like smaller scale uh double a or a indie games (laughs) that uh you know maybe take 10 15 hours to beat but are still really interesting and have some cool stuff going on but you know when you're done with miles morales uh you're gonna want to play some other stuff and i think this is what's going to fill the gaps until we find out more about some of the bigger titles and that's okay yeah 
L- like with the PS4 launch, I went back to Resogun more than yep. anything else on the AAA side. So, yeah, it, it'll definitely be nice to have Miles Morales this time around. But I, mm-hmm. I definitely feel like these types of games I will be uh, clicking into. And I'm glad that we saw the, a bit of the pathless gameplay. They finally showed uh, after all of the jokes about it, what actually is Bug Snacks. They showed a bit of actual gameplay for Bug Snacks. Um, so we and then, of course, also got six or seven minutes of godfall gameplay and i do yeah like regardless of how we felt i think about each individual game i am glad on the whole that we were getting chunks of gameplay to be seen max as you were saying like i do think that is probably the best approach for what state of play can be is the place to show off these more bite-sized demos that would almost feel like hands-off behind closed doors demos at e3 um but getting those out there to the public um, I, I did want to briefly mention I'm personally really excited because I loved the original Alan Wake, but the control uh, expansion, the second expansion is coming on August 27th, which is also not that far off. Um, they have been teasing it would be Alan Wake related for a while, and this all but confirmed it pretty much with Alan Wake showing up. So I'm, I'm excited to see how <clears throat> deeply it goes into that. Um, because Alan Wake 2 has been one of the things that like it's one of those never announced sequels that everyone always asks the developer hey when are you going to make it and they just never have been able to uh, I know Remedy finally got the rights back to Alan Wake uh, I think late last year or sometime last year so I wouldn't be su- this is surprised if this is like the start of more Alan Wake to come for people who are into that series um, I, I did feel like it was worth mentioning because this was one that came up right after the show. And I know some people may be asking, um, there was an indie game that was called Aeon or Eon Must Die uh, that we saw a story trailer for that people thought looked really cool. And it was a really great looking art style, really snazzy, um, like futuristic look to it. Uh, after that happened, there started to come out with uh, allegations. And I think there has been stuff previous to this, but after the state of play, there were allegations that essentially the uh, entire team that had been developing the game left. Uh, this trailer was created without any of their involvement. Uh, there's apparently even possible alleged conflicts about the IP going on and who owns it or whether it's been stolen. Um, we are looking into this stuff and investigating it. So like, I, I don't want to harp too long on whether or not this information is valid based on the YouTube comment that has been seen. Um, but obviously there is something to look into the, to the story. So we are like, as I, said, as I said, we're recording this an hour after, um, you know, like Matt Kimmel. Yeah, this is team. we're looking into it and investigating, but we don't have a answer to what is actually going on with that. Regardless of like what the what the game is or what this looks like, it looks cool, I guess. But the thing that popped up first where it was like it was like limestone games, hardcore game developers. And I was like, the hell does that mean? Like they only make hardcore. I'm like, what do they have more crunch? Do they like do they make your family crunch too? And I like just came out like 20 minutes later and I was like, Oh, I'm glad I didn't tweet a joke about that. Like, good God. That yeah. is that that is hardcore game development, I guess. You get your controversy just immediately after the trailer drops. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, why why wait a day? Just have the controversy come immediately with the trailer. But yeah, that's definitely one we'll be looking into, but I just didn't want anyone who's maybe listening and saw that to think we were ignoring it. It's definitely something we're investigating, but we, uh, especially the approach we've been taking recently on IGN is we want to thoroughly vet, you know, the accusations and the allegations going on before we hop on the story and start kind of looking at it with only half the information. Uh, But we will definitely be looking into that. Um, I I did want to point to, uh, unless there's anything else that stood out from you guys, I did want to point to a couple of uh, community responses I saw from the state of play. Uh, including one from a uh, good friend of the show, Yair, who said, love that they showed a lot of gameplay. Uh, Genshin Impact and Crash were the highlights for me. Uh, Genshin Impact is that one. I really haven't been paying much attention to it, but it's the one that everyone basically called a Breath of the Wild clone, That, but anime, but isn't necessarily exactly Breath of the Wild. Uh, I have really the, not... Breath of the Waifu. That's what I've been <laughs> Breath of the Waifu. Um, I think it looked cool from that trailer but i also have no i've not really paid attention to this game at all it's been a total blind spot for me but people seem pretty excited about it um so we'll we'll keep an eye on that one i think it got an autumn release window so that's coming sometime this fall uh jordan responded to my tweet uh and you may know jordan from his work writing the game ghost of tsushima uh if you didn't know but uh jordan wrote in and said thanks to the expectations that they set beforehand it was great and still had some surprises as well uh also enjoyed how they hit so many different genres and types of games and yeah i i would say like i don't think the the state of play excelled at any one particular part but it did offer a, a pretty good variety of stuff uh when it comes to ps4 ps5 and psvr um 
Nathan said, way too long. The Pathless and Godfall outstayed their welcome. Crash 4 presentation sold me on the game. Raid anniversary. Oh, right. I forgot that happened. Got me hyped. And Control with Alan Wake has me the happiest I've been this whole summer. Overall, needed to be shorter. Six out of ten. Not bad, but not good. And yeah, Brian, to your point earlier, I do think like a, a shorter state of play would benefit them. Like a 20 to 25 minute presentation, I think, is kind of a reasonable expectation or ask from the audience. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that was that wasn't like 40. That wasn't a 40 minute state of play. That was like a, you know, 25 minute state of play with like 10 extra minutes of Godfall or whatever. That, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, could've, they could have cut that down, I think. Their E3 showcases used to be like an hour or more. And so to do, you know, 43 minutes on stuff that probably wouldn't have fit in an E3 showcase is uh, kind of stretching for time. You know? Yeah, most most of the games that were shown in this would have been part of one of those rapid super cuts that they run like halfway through an E3 showcase. Mm -hmm. Like after they're like, done announcing how many PS4s got sold or whatever. Yeah, and there's like this like slow sort of like Evanescence cover of like a <laughs> of a faster song. <laughs> You know, and there's this woman yeah. singing. Yeah. <laughs> um, speaking of, <clears throat> never seen the goofy cover of Evanescence on YouTube. Oh, That's good God. Don't look at it. Don't look at it. Up. Oh, it's uh, going to be stuck in my head now. <laughs> yep. No. Porsche. Uh, God damn it. Brigitte or Bridget, apologies. I, I am not sure which way to pronounce your name, said, I think it was well balanced and I'm glad Sony set the expectations that they did. Highlight for me was getting a release window for Genshin Impact. And yeah, I, I do think. The setting expectations was one of the, the best moves they made. But again, with there being such a hanging cloud of what we still need to know about PS5, it, it did bring these this weird balance of stuff. Um, going through some of the others, KG said it feels strange. I know they said expectations, but I also feel like most of this could have been saved to fit in between bigger announcements, uh, like you guys were just saying, especially since the PlayStation fan base is really waiting for more PlayStation 5 info right now. Um, and that seemed to be one of the more general sentiments I saw. You know, people would point out crash or bug snacks or control, whatnot. But it, it did feel like this sort of hanging question of what's to come, which is what we spent a lot of the last episode on. So kind of looking ahead, um, the PS5 question aside, I do want to ask you guys, what what do you think state of play should be going forward? Do you think it needs to have like a specific identity? Can it be this malleable? Hey, it's 25 minutes on a single game. Hey, it's 30 minutes on a, a host of different games. Hey, there's no first party games in this. That that feels like a really weird miss to me. Like when it is the state of play and it is the state of PlayStation to not have PlayStation be there feels strange. What, what do you guys think state of play needs to be going? I'm, I'm actually OK with that because I think that it elevates a lot of their partners and smaller studios to uh, the level that their first party stuff usually would be at. And I, I think when every digital uh, video game storefront has a discoverability issue um, that anything you can do to help game titles like this get out is, is a good thing. That thing that said, like, I, I, I feel like having like 10 minutes of Godfall sort of flies in the face of, of that, of that thesis, because this, this would be a good, a, a place to sort of like, you know, take a bunch of smaller studios and, and get their names and games out. Uh, I'm okay with this format being malleable and evolving over time because, um, from the start of these things we've been like that was cool but next time you guys should do this and each one changes a little bit sometimes there's either vo driven sometimes it's just you know slides and we've we've been here through all of them doing the show together and we've been you know praise uh, praising or critical uh of, of every decision and every change and so um I, I i don't think it's necessarily something that has to be stuck in stone um because then you get you, what you end up getting is basically repeating the same mistakes over and over again. That said, I feel like this one kind of missed more than it hit. And so I do hope they figure out a way to consolidate it and maybe bring in a surprise at the end, uh, maybe sort of like up the tempo a little bit. But in general, I think like the, it, I, I didn't hate this or anything like that. So I hope I hope it's something that keeps growing and evolving. Max, how about for you? I think they're doing a good job of managing the expectations. I feel like they could do an even better job. Um, I mean, the, again, the format has been so sort of all over the place that uh, I don't know, like maybe if like either either it should be a little bit more structured where they're like, hey, we're showing off, uh, you know, a brand new first party game, two PSVR games and, you know, three indies that are coming out later this year. Like that would like to really just really dial into that, you know, as opposed to I mean, again, but it's like then you you have to be like you have to spoil us the, the surprises basically by saying what they are in advance. Um, I don't know. I think maybe leaning into sort of the different, different sort of flavors of what they could be showing off. Um, 
Like, you know, Nintendo is pretty good about that where they're doing, we're doing a Pokemon Direct. Or like, we're doing a, you know, a mini Direct focused around this game. They could have totally done like, hey, we're doing a, a Godfall state of play. Tune in this Thursday to get an inside deep dive look at everything coming from Gearbox latest looter slasher later this mm-hmm. year, next year. You know, like it just really like as opposed to just sort of setting expectations for a giant mystery box, basically being like, OK, let's directly reach out to the audience who would be really excited about this particular thing. Yeah. Or they could have just been like, we're hyper focusing this one on just PS4 and PSVR. You know, I think the fact that there was any PS5 in there at all, the, the big issue right now, like the big elephant in the room, is that we don't know the, the price and release date for the PS5. And so that anything that they tell us right now is going to be a distraction from the main course that we're all waiting for. Like, yeah. we're all waiting for the most significant information of the upcoming generation to drop from these two massive competing entities, and neither of them has said a damn word. And so mm-hmm. that anything they say in between now and then, it's going to be like, that's nice. But, and so like this, this was cool, but like we all, it ended and we're all just left sitting right back where we started, which is when is the PS5 out? How much will it cost? Like these games are, you know, cool, great, awesome. Yeah. You're putting games on PS5. What's it going to cost for me to buy this system? You know, the, the bug snacks and Godfall things could have both been dropped at the end of the PS5 reveal. And they could have put up like a little card that says like, stick around in just a moment for an inside look at two of these great recently announced games. And then you're riding that high of like these games that just got shown off. And yep. it doesn't have, you know, six weeks of question marks in between them where instead it's just like, hey, here's like, like, I mean, that's what, you know, Nintendo would do with Treehouse at E3 where they would have like a big yeah. direct where they announced a ton of stuff. And they would be sort of segue into like the more sort of long form explanation breakdowns of, of those of those games. Right. Yeah, they, sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say, if you're wondering why we keep bringing up Nintendo, that's because this is this was entirely their style. This is their vehicle for getting content out for years since they they abandoned e3 live press conferences a while ago and and sony and now microsoft have lifted their you know their versions of that and so i think comparisons are just yeah absolutely and you know even then the treehouse live stuff they, they announced uh the metroid 2 remake on the treehouse they'll announce like big stuff during those so it can still be a, a place for big games it doesn't have to be like we're you know pushing stuff away out of the spotlight it can still really matter just a a matter of uh defining it and setting those expectations yeah for me i feel like if this had been um i I think brian you'd brought it up first but you both spoke to it like if this had been almost two different uh state of plays with maybe a little more in each like there was the ps4 and psvr state of play and then they were like here's a third party ps5 state of play and it was like the five games here that were ps5 and then maybe like one or two more plus a Miles Morales follow-up trailer. I mean, like we're getting that game in three months. Uh, another teaser would not have been the worst thing. Right. Uh, I, I feel like had those happened, you know, one week apart from each other, that would allow them two days to own the conversation, speak to both audiences, and then set the stage for the big PS5, you know, info drop that has to happen. Yeah, and if they're not going to say anything about the PS5 for a while, just do PS4 state to play, service the 120-something million uh, users out there who are ready and willing to get new games who are maybe not necessarily diving headfirst into next gen uh in november and so i I think that's a totally justifiable tactic Uh, that said there's there's going to be some growing pains as a sort of cross-generational year that we're heading into right now where uh things that look really cool will get announced for ps4 because there is a massive audience there this is not like a wii u situation where they can't wait to run out of that room Mm -hmm. um Games will still get announced for PS4 for a while, so I I don't see a problem with them just being like, here's a PS4-driven state of play, you know? Yeah, it's totally something where they're not going to instantly ignore that 100-plus million audience. Uh, They do have to support them until, you know, the majority moves to the PS5, and especially given the economy, given where things are, it wouldn't be surprising if that takes a little while. But yeah, it, it's going to be an interesting balance. Like there was a game or two in there that was only for PS4 and announced for 2021. And I was actually like surprised and it was nice to see that happen. Even if they were smaller indie games, it's like, OK, we are still like this is going to be a platform that we're not just uh, moving entirely to the PS5. They're going to find a way to balance until it doesn't make sense to anymore. But which is which is good because Ghost of Tsushima, Last of Us, uh, they were massive system sellers, you know, like yeah. massive. Yeah, they, they made a special edition Death Stranding console last year. There are a bunch of new people who have bought new systems. You look at MPD sales data, people are constantly buying PS4s. And so letting them know that they're going to have new stuff to play all into next year. And probably, I mean, honestly, I imagine new games will get announced 
for the PS4 for the next five years, you know, whether they get- At the get, very least, Just Dance. Yeah, yes, at the very least, Just Dance and some Madden as well. Yeah, but no, I, I wouldn't be surprised if for at least a few more years we see PS4 releases, especially, you know, you're saying the special editions last year. I cannot even imagine how much they're going to put the PS4 on sale during Black Friday or how many games are going to come bundled because last year it was like 200 for a PS4 and you got Spider-Man, The Last of Us Remastered and Horizon. Like, yep. we're only going to see at least that deal, if not better this year, and people will buy that because it's going to be the affordable, available option when the PS5 probably sells out very quickly. Yeah, and also is it goes on sale for, you know, 400, 500 bucks. And so I, that, weirdly, they're, they will be competing with themselves on Black Friday. They always do, but I think more than ever now, um, which is, you know, a good problem to have because all the money goes in the same bank account, I imagine. You would hope that it'd be weird if there's a PS4 labeled bank account. In the <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's how bank accounts work. I still haven't gotten one. Um, but yeah, I, I keep all my money in the backyard. But it, uh, <laughs> it, it's going to be a very interesting few months to watch how PlayStation balances everything. Because we, we've talked a lot on the show of like, it felt like they were saving the PS5 to talk about because they still had so much to talk about with the PS4. And we've gotten past most of that, but we're still waiting to talk about the PS5. Yep. Still a chance it gets delayed too. You never know. Yeah. Just saying. <laughs> you never know. Yeah. yeah, 2020. Hey. They haven't put a date on it. Cyberpunk has had like four release dates. It's anything is possible at this point. Still a chance that one gets delayed too. I mean, yeah. Don't do it. Yeah. Don't blame me. Don't yeah. delay that. Play, Look, the last the time you said you said they won't delay it and then they I did. don't want to talk so about it. I they don't want to end the show. I don't want to talk about this anymore. <laughs> uh, anyway, let's look back at our favorite delays that Damn felt like they were really personal attacks Damn. on us after we recorded the show. Um, no, of course, I mean, we're saying all that. This is the second episode we're recording. So you think we could capture all the PS5 news. Chances are they'll announce something Friday morning just to screw with us. But of course, we'll cover that on our normal episode of Beyond, uh, which normally airs every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Pacific on beyond.ign.com, youtube.com slash IGN Beyond, and your favorite podcast services around the world. Uh, August is looking a little quieter when it comes to big releases, but we will, I'm sure, have stuff to talk about when it comes to the future of PlayStation and the future of this crazy fall of releases that we'll have. Uh, of course, we're also on IGN.com. Uh, you can find all the work that we're doing. Brian and Max do up at noon. Now at 5, uh, you guys are normally on Thursdays, correct? Yes, Thursdays, 5 p.m. Pacific time from 5 to 6. Come hang out, come party, sound off in the chat. It's a very loose show, so, you know, yeah, we wrote like half a run of show for it, and it's in uh, an hour, 45 minutes. We should probably get on that. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, I, I wouldn't expect it any other way, to be honest. Uh, but of course, you can also get some amazing cosplay from you guys on that show. So That's true. We dressed yeah. up as Yakuza characters recently, so that's fun. I it was fantastic. Big. <laughs> uh if you missed that go definitely check out that episode and of course you can catch uh all of our coverage of everything else going on in the world of playstation on ign.com i don't think we mentioned it in the last episode but we did also recently just update our top 25 ps4 game list uh now that seemingly every first party playstation exclusive is out who knows if they decide to surprise us but uh with that we decided to update the list so you can find out where last of us part two ghost of tsushima and a few other games that have come out since we last updated ended up on that list uh otherwise Go get angry yet yeah <laughs> sound off in the comment about how the numbers are wrong uh, and I, i'll say the same thing i always say when these lists go up we we fought, we had fights with each other before you had fights in the comments so just yes. know that i'm you know there's things we all fought for that we didn't get and that's just part of it and you know that's why i don't talk to john ryan anymore like it's really simple so. yeah I do all of my conversations good guy. through Lucy O'Brien. Um, <laughs> but yeah, those those are always fun to put together, but definitely challenging. And I, I'm sure if we all had our own top 25 list go up at the same time, they'd all look very different. Uh, but we can maybe talk about that sometime in the, the maybe doldrums of August. We'll see how the next month goes. But anyway, thank you, Brian and Max, for joining me for this episode. Thank you to Red, our producer, for producing this episode. And thank you to all of you out there listening and watching and supporting the show. It means so much to us. We appreciate you checking in, especially during all these weird, strange times. Uh, we hope you're safe. We hope you're well. And as always, beyond. Beyond. Beyond.